the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may be, begin from thee and by thee. Be happy then to Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Divine Grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So Father asked me to talk about Ember Days and Rogation Days and what they were and what they are um, and some of the things that are actually behind it. We obviously know that this is one of the traditions, which is one of the first that was to collapse in the New Rite, that, they, um, that the traditions were lost very quickly, and any tradition um, that had any aspect of disciplinary matters, if there were any disciplinary matters connected to it, it was usually one of the first that was lost. So in the Rogations and the Ember Days, there's actually two components. The first is the liturgical side of the, uh, the actual days, which we still um, observe in the Old Rite. And then there's the disciplinary norms, which the church are no longer binding, but we're going to talk a little bit about what those were, and the idea that it's a good idea to continue uh, those in your own particular life and the reasons why. So the first thing we want to do is talk a little bit about Ember Days. The Ember Days, um, actually in Latin, the Embers is what we call in uh, in English, and the reason they were called embers is because they were a time of burning. It was a time in which you would actually increase virtue and increase to um, so that your charity could be more perfected. But the Latin is the quatuor tempora, which is the four seasons or the four times of the year in which they would actually have as far as the ember days. And so they were um, periods in which there was a liturgical side to it to, sell, to observe that it's a penitential day specifically. And then second, there were, there were days of fasting and absence. So the liturgical day was the penitential side of it. And then the actual fasting and absence was the um, disciplinary requirements during those days. The purpose of their introduction originally was in order to encourage prayer and fasting. And this was in relationship to a few things. Because it marked the four seasons, it dealt with the gifts of nature. That is the fact that they were done in the fall, in the winter, the spring and the summer, it indicated that there were four seasons were there, that that had a direct impact on things like harvests and things of that sort. Historically, many theologians believe, um, although for me the jury is still kind of out a little bit, but many of them believe that it was actually a result of the fact that the Romans had marked the four um, uh, times of the year with certain um, practices, religious practices. And so because it was connected to agriculture and their native gods, Etc. The church, in order to supplant those practices um, in a pagan sense, started the Ember Days in order so that people would have a Christian uh, marking of the specific parts of the calendar. This um, was not uncommon where the church would take a practice of the pagans and then Christianize it, is remove the pagan elements, take the elements that were natural and maybe good, and then sanctify them through um, some particular teaching of the church. But in a relationship, so part of it had to do with the gifts of nature, so there should be an appreciation. So one of the first aspects of the rogation of the sorry of Ember Days is the is the virtue of gratitude, the thanking of God for the things that He gives us that make our lives good. Second, it was to teach men to make moderated use of them. That is, okay, God gives us these goods; these things are good. But like anything else that's good, in relationship to us, if we don't use them in a moderated way, we become vicious. That is, we end up with vices and difficulties. And then the other part was to actually assist the needy. That is, those who actually needed them. So it was a day of prayer and fasting and, of course, the abstinence. This brings up a particularly interesting point about virtue. Virtue is a habit. It's a good habit in which a person's in the habit of consistently acting a specific way in relationship to a specific thing. So for example, in the virtue of fasting, it is that the person actually has a virtue in which they can easily turn aside from the goods of food and only eat uh, what is absolutely necessary or not eat at all for a short period of time, but they eat only what is absolutely necessary in order for their, um, to, to bring their faculties more subjected to reason. In other words, what fasting does is we have lower appetites Fasting brings those appetites more under the control of reason. People often ask me, well, how do I know my appetites are out of control? It's very simple. 
If you have any emotion, any emotion at all, that is not perfectly subordinated to reason, and what does that perfect subordination look like? It's your emotion never moves until reason says to, and then when it does move, it only moves to the degree that reason says it should move. That's what perfect virtue looks like in relationship to an emotion. So if you have any emotion that is not perfectly subordinated to reason in those two ways, then you know there's a vice somewhere, there's some defect somewhere, or there's not sufficient virtue to get the thing sufficient, to get it completely subordinated. But this means that we have to continually act or continually practice virtues in order to main, even maintain them. St. Thomas Aquinas observes that in this life, even in relationship to the moral virtues that we have perfected, God will allow us to suffer temptations from time to time in order for us to maintain the virtue, if nothing else. Sometimes he'll let the temptations become even more intense, even ex more than what we would normally experience based on our disposition, in order to become more perfected in that particular area, that is, to, great, to gain a higher level of virtue. But it's something that we have to do habitually. This means that if you just stop doing it, if you just stop doing a moral virtue, over the course of time it's going to decline. And you're going to find yourself in a situation where you don't have virtue and you have to rebuild it again. Okay, that very reality is part of the reason behind Ember Days. The practice in the church was that you had to fast from the beginning of Lent until the end. And the fast was fairly severe. For those who didn't have any kind of physical needs or requirements or weren't working at hard construction jobs and things of that sort, your, your main meal was eight ounces of food every day for the entire duration of Lent. That was your main meal. The other two couldn't even equal that. So we're talking about a, a, a very serious fasting so we get those appetites under control. According to modern psychology and even some of the theologians, it takes three weeks to corrupt a vice and three weeks to develop a habit, a good habit. So that's six weeks, which is roughly the length of Lent. So the church would basically get you to the point where if you follow the church's discipline, by the time you got through Lent, you had the virtue of fasting. Today, people, most Catholics, do not at all have the virtue of fasting. As soon as I recommend to somebody, maybe you should fast, I just get this, oh, you know, like, oh, boy, this is just, he's basically asking me for all my teeth to be extracted without Novocaine, you know, you know. And you're just like, look, it's not that bad. Okay. The one thing that's good about fasting is when you master fasting, you realize I'm not going to die if I don't get my next meal. I mean, I can go a little while. Okay. But they don't have the virtue. So if you followed the old discipline, that is, if you actually followed the, the, uh, where you fasted for the entire duration of Lent, by the time you got through Lent, you had the virtue of fasting. And then the church added on top of that the ember days and certain vigils. What did that mean? On ember days, you basically had to do the fast again. So that four times a year, you were fasting for at least the, uh, three days out of that week. Then... There were certain vigils, that is, the vigil of Pentecost, the Assumption, the Feast of All Saints, and the Nativity of our Lord. You had to fast on those days as well. So that what would happen is, is that once you um, gained the virtue of fasting through Lent, then you were doing it periodically throughout the year to maintain it so that when you went back into Lent, it wasn't so brutal. Today, because we don't fast at all, although some people fast, it's called dieting. Right. All dieting is is fasting, but for the wrong motive. Now they might be dieting for the, for health reasons, and then it can actually be part of the virtue of fasting. But there's a supernatural virtue of fasting where you're doing it to subordinate your faculties so that you can be more subordinated to God. That's why we actually do it. So the church then would have ember days throughout the course of the year in order to maintain the virtue, because most people don't maintain their virtue. In the new laws of the church, you're only required to fast on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Now, if you do that, you do fulfill the obligations of, of obedience to the church. So you do fulfill that. But you do not fulfill the requirements of the natural law in relationship to fasting. 
St. Thomas says that the natural law commands, commands, which means it requires all of the virtues, which basically means we have a natural connection to perfection. And that perfection means that your, your soul has to be endowed or adored with all of the virtues. And two of those virtues are abstinence and fasting. And if you don't do that, you're never fully going to reach perfection. A lot of people think, okay, well, this is kind of the rocky road through the spiritual life. There's fasting and abstinence on this side. Those are pretty heavy rocks. I don't want to have to deal with those. So maybe I'll just do a lot of prayer or things like that, and then I can bypass it. That's not how this works. You have to fast. You have to get to the point where you um, master that in order to get the concupiscible appetite. That's the one that desires food. You have to get that thing under control. And it's also necessary even on the side of intellect and will. Why? Because when we never fast, you can tell it when you just watch people. You know, they did these studies, and they found out that, um, I, I, some of you have probably heard me say this, that when they did these brain studies, they found out that when women eat chocolate, it floods their brain with pleasure drugs. That's why they feel loved when they eat chocolate, generally speaking. Guys don't get that. But guys do get it from meat. In fact, what they discovered is, if a guy just looks at meat, his brain starts pumping out these pleasure drugs. <laughs> Which is why whenever I see a guy that's a vegetarian, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> All right. But the point being is, is this. The point is, is this, is that we have this, this uh, you know, we, it's very easy for us to become attached. You can watch people in relationship to food. When people, how do you know you've gotten, you've mastered fasting? That when you're fasting, if the food's put in front of you, St. Thomas says you can delay the eating of it until modesty says it's the right time. Whereas most people, that's not the case. If they fasted for any length of time, you put the food in front of it, and they're basically like an animal. You know, they're just eating it very quickly. Whereas it means if you have the actual control over it, you can look in front of the food. So when guys see the meat, they can kind of, they can actually put it aside if necessary. Okay. So basically what that means is if you follow the current laws of the church, you will fulfill the obligations of obedience, but not the obligations for the virtue of fasting that natural law requires. And so, again, it makes you obedient, but it doesn't perfect your virtue. So it doesn't mean you're off the hook for fasting. In the old code, it was required fasting in the old code of canon law it was required fast and abstinence on ember days. And this is helpful to us because it helps us to refocus and realize our dependency on God and the need for the virtues associated with prayer. So it was also a day, these were days of prayer as well. You know, once in a while you'll hear people say, my work is my prayer. That's nonsense. It's total nonsense. First of all, the definition of prayer is lifting the mind and heart to God. Working isn't lifting your mind and heart to God, unless you've reached the transforming union where you can do both at the same time, which is like one point, well, it's point, point, point zero 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 one percent of Christians who reach that. So what does this mean? It means it's also reminding us that there are certain days when we should intensify our prayer. Now, prayer is not a virtue. It's a good act. The virtue it falls under is the virtue of religion. It's an act of the virtue of religion. And so you have an obligation to continue to, to develop your prayer so that the virtue of religion becomes perfected. But in relationship to the fasting and the abstinence, and you have the prayer, so it's lifting the mind and heart to God. What's the heart? It's the will. It's not the emotions. It's the will. So what this means is, is if you master those two, what happens is, is every time we have a vice in our lower faculties, in our emotions, our lower faculties, there's a concomitant weakness in the will and a darkness in the intellect. People who fast with somewhat regularity will very often observe the fact that they have a lot more intellectual clarity than when they weren't. In fact, one of the effects of, of gluttony is dullness of the senses and dullness of the intellect, where you just, you just, you're not too bright, because you're just eating all the time, right? Okay. With prayer, of course, and so as the will re is required in fasting to stay the course, because the lower appetites, when they don't get what they want, they start screaming, I want, I want my food, I want my food. 
Whereas the will has to say, no, this is what we're going to do. It's constancy. It's the virtue of constancy. People who never fast, in my experience, never master constancy in other areas even. Okay, so this means that we have to refocus and intensify on certain days in the developing of these virtues. But this also calls attention to when we, when we forego something, when we're constantly eating something, we, we, we kind of fall prey to what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, if you can't fast, then you can't really feast. And if you can't feast, you can't really fast. No, there's a, that's a loaded statement. Basically what that means is, is this. If you can't fast and you're always feasting, then it's not really a feast. It's just your average day of eating. Whereas when you fast, when it comes time to feasting, there's an appreciation of the food that you have that you don't have when you're not fasting. That's why, that's how you can develop the virtue of gratitude. But then on the other hand, if you can't feast, you can't fast. There's a kind of Pelagianism uh, that is floating around, um, kind of a Gnosticism that's floating around in the traditional movement that pleasure is evil. You hear this from time to time. No, I can't do that. Why? Because it's pleasurable. Well, what's that got to do with it? Okay. The moral of the story is, is that the person who can't enjoy the food, that is, the person who can't fa uh, feast, never develops the virtue of temperance. Because temperance is the moderation of pleasure in relationship to bodily goods. It's a very key point. If you can't enjoy something, it doesn't mean you're attached to it. But if you can't enjoy it, it means that there's ins the vice of insensibility. This is one of the reasons why the, the people who are, they, very often they become uh, very dour and very negative because they're not able to appreciate the good. So it's a matter of the moderation of it. Not too much, not too little, based upon the particular individual. But this is one of the reasons why, again, if you can't feast, then in the end you can't really fast because your motivation is not uh, rightly ordered. Your motivation is, I've got to stay away from pleasure. I've got to stay away from anything that might draw me into sin. Well, if that's the case, you might as well go stick your head in the sand and hope God deprives you of enough oxygen before you can get to purgatory. <laughs> All right. The point being is, is that you actually have to work on these virtues and you have to... Uh, mo it's a matter of the moderation. St. Thomas asks a very important question, and this is one of the differences between dieting and fasting. He asks the question, what's the difference between the natural virtue and the supernatural virtue in relationship to fasting? And he says that there's two differences. In the natural virtue of fasting, there's a, the mean between excess and defect. There's the mean, which is basically ordered towards a person's health, and that is the end. So there's a mean, and that is ordered towards health. That's the end. That's on the natural virtue. On the supernatural virtue, he says, in order to gain greater control of the lower faculties, as we understand by revelation, what St. Paul teaches us and our Lord teaches us, he says that the mean shifts more toward the side of defect. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy it, it just means you have to be a little bit more rigorous in it in order to gain greater control over it. And he says, and then the end is different. The end is God. And this is one of the reasons why doing Ember Days throughout the course of the year helps people to refocus because it's too easy, especially today where we're so busy, it's too easy to get so hung up in worldly matters that we forget about God in that process. The Ember Days were arranged and prescribed for the entire church by Gregory the Seventh, And so there are certain times of the year you can watch for them in the calendar. This is actually done on specific times. It's interesting that it's observed in the Latin church. It is not observed in the Eastern church. But they do have a more severe fasting for us than, than we do during Lent. In the Roman Missal, in the formulary for the Ember Days, they originally retained in part the old practice of lessons from Scripture in addition to two, uh, ordinarily um, two for Wednesday, or sorry, ordinarily two, and then on Wednesday there's three. 
For Saturdays, originally there used to be six or seven readings at Mass. I've always found it ironic that in the new Mass, to give greater solemnity to Sundays and certain feast days, they have two epistles in the Gospel. In the old rite, that's considered penitentiary, penitential. <laughs> so, because why? Because you're doing more and it requires more discipline in order to do it if you're going to do it well and if you're going to do it right. These were reduced down to where they have what's called the Missed Langeur, which is where you have four readings. If there's an ordination on that specific day, then all four readings have to be done. So it's a very long ordination mass. And traditionally, um, the ordination masses were very often done on um, ember days um, in order to uh, make it also somewhat penitential. But they reduced, so some of them just now have two epistles. There's one that has four, but then there's also the Missa Bravior, which is a shorter Mass, which the priest can say at his discretion, as long as it's not an ordination Mass. In Canon 1006, um, this is in the Old Code, it says, the ordinations of clerics, or to the sacred ministers, is to be celebrated among the more solemn Masses on the Saturday of the, of the Ember Days, or the Saturdays before um, the Passion of Our Lord or Holy Saturday. That's when ordinations used to normally be timed. So the Ember Days then, it's something that you should watch for. You're not required to observe the fasting during those times, but as a matter of maintain, if you're not doing something to maintain the virtue throughout the, like if you're not fasting once a week as a general rule or something like that, or at least a couple of times a month, then you really should be um, follow. Then you really should try and follow the Ember Days, as a matter of the tradition within your home. Because a lot of traditional Catholics want to establish the traditions within their home. It's a really good practice to observe the Ember Days during those days. Now I realize the kids are going to be saying, "Oh no, it's an Ember Day. Don't worry about it. They'll thank you later." All right. Once they realize, hey, at least I have some level of virtue here. Uh, but the point is, is that. The, if you can do those during those particular times of the year as kind of a tradition within the family to maintain what the church had seen as the necessity for these things of its disciplines in the past, that would be very helpful. What about rogation days? Rogation days are specifically days of prayer, and they formerly were also days of fasting. They were instituted by the church to appease God's anger at man's sin. It's kind of interesting that at the very time in which men are reaching an apex in their sin, there's practically no sin so heinous, so grave, that isn't fully out in public all the time anymore. But we've reached an apex in a certain sense. I don't think we're fully there yet, or I suppose you could say we haven't bought them fully all the way out. But is at the time in which we're not making reparation. People forget that God, in creating the universe, created it for His glory. Therefore, we who are created for His glory uh, are entirely dependent on Him and therefore, as a matter of justice, owe to Him a perfect life. When we do not fulfill that perfection of life, we therefore have to make up for it, and that's called restitution. In the church, that became known as reparation. But reparation is... Uh, includes something notionally that's a little different from restitution. Restitution is you pay back to the person that you have taken from. So if I stole 50 cents from you, I have to give you back 50 cents. Reparation means you're also, there's some kind of a payback. You're restoring the order of justice. But you're also repairing the damage that's caused. And basically what that means is, is every time you sin, you introduce disorder and damage into a twofold order. The first is your own interior faculties and your own interior life. This is why you have to go to purgatory. Because you've got these this disorders that you've introduced as a result of your sin, and so now you have to go to purgatory to repair the damage. The second thing is, you have to repair the damage in the external order. 
Now, normally, that comes for fulfilling the natural order of justice. That is, by giving to the person that you've hurt or the person that you've caused the damage to or the situation in which you've caused the difficulty that you go and you straighten it out. You repair the damage. You make reparation. However, there's a twofold order of justice. There's the natural order of justice that's between us, creatures. But then there's the order between you and God. And every time you commit a sin or even commit a sin against someone else, you're violating the rights that he has in relationship to this person being treated properly because he created them for that end. So if you don't do that, you not only have to make the uh, reparation in the natural order, you have to repair the damage between you and God. That is the, the, the detraction of the glory that you took from his creation. That's your obligation. You're not going to get off the hook. You have to pay the whole thing back. Except, St. Thomas says, there are certain kinds of sins for which restitution cannot be made. And he gives the exa two examples, if I remember correctly. The first is, when a man rapes a woman, he cannot restore the damage. It's permanent. Now, she might heal and she might grow wholly th through that process of, of healing and um, forgiving him, etc. But he can't restore what he's taken from her. It's the same thing, he says, in relationship to murder. Someone who kills somebody cannot pay back to society fully for what he's taken. This is one of the reasons why he and St. Augustine said that capital punishment was a way to reconcile the sinner, the person who had committed the capital crime to the society. Because through giving his life, he's paying back with the, the thing that he can, the, the thing he can the most in order to pay back what he can. Even though he can't fully pay back, at least he can pay back to this degree. And as a result of that, He's reconciled with the community, St. Augustine says. So what does this mean in relationship to prayer and man's transgressions? It means that there are certain times of the year that God would call attention to us to make reparation to God, to renew that in our minds. The fact of the matter is, as human beings laboring under original and actual sin, we quickly degenerate into cluelessness. In other words, what we tend to do is we just blithely go along and because we really kind of want this perpetual, pleasant, and happy life, and we tend to forget sometimes what our real obligations are. And so the church has to remind us of this. How do we know this is the case? How many of you here know somebody who doesn't have a clue about most of the teachings of the church? You can all raise your hands. And why is that the case? Because they haven't been reminded from the pulpit year after year about it. In the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska, they are every priest is required to give at least one homily a year on contraception. The people in the Diocese of Lincoln have no excuse to say, oh, I didn't know that was a teaching of the church. But what's happening is, is, if we're not reminded with any kind of regularity, then we tend to fall into spiritual mediocrity, or even doctrinal mediocrity, or doctrinal heresy, actually, which is slowly happening. So this is why the church would have the rogation days, to remind us you have to make reparation to God. You still have this, idea, this obligation. These were days of reparation. And so reparation reparation is necessary. It's not something that we have a choice about. We can't just say, oh, God will understand. God's merciful. Oh, yes, indeed, he is. But what is mercy? Mercy is the loosening of the bonds of justice. If there is no justice, there is no such thing as mercy. It's that simple. Because if there's no justice, there's no loosening of the bonds of justice, therefore there's no mercy. The reason God is infinitely merciful is because he's infinitely just. He extracts people from people what is absolutely down to the last farthing. If you read Matthew 5, 26, that's his reference, basically. That's the one that the church traditionally uses as a sign of purgatory. That you'll be thrown in jail until you pay the last farthing. 
You have to make reparation. Now, in purgatory, the way that's made is our faculties get straightened out. All the damage that we've introduced into reality, we do have to consign it to God's mercy because there's certain things that we do, we're never going to fully repair the damage. And we just have to ask God, have mercy on it, and we can pray. And this is where the prayers come in. We can petition God for the graces to be introduced in back into his creation to repair the damage so that it doesn't stop. Or so that, it, so that it stops and doesn't continue from generation to generation. This is an age of where people have no responsibility. It's a marvel. You can watch television. Some guy walks into some place and starts mowing everybody down. Before you know it, they're blaming the NRA for lack of um, gun laws. They're like, excuse me, the NRA isn't the one that went in there and mowed them down. It was the guy that went in there and mowed them down. Right? So they're blaming everything. They're blaming everything but the person who's actually responsible. Now, this started with the greatest generation, and it transitioned to the hippie generation, and now it's just part of everybody's generation, where people don't take responsibility for every, anything. And that largely is because of the fact to be responsible means you have to be willing to suffer, and people aren't willing to suffer. But getting back to the rogation days, we have to take responsibility for what we've done, pray to God to repair the damage, to make reparation for it, the rogation days were also there to ask for protection in calamities. There, these can be from a natural cause, which God can avert. God can stop tornadoes. God can stop you know, any kind of natural disaster. He can also um, stop them from a diabolic cause. So they can be natural. You can have net, or just the natural conditions. We know it causes a tornado. It's cold, water, or cold air coming over uh, warm air. We know that, and it rolls, and then it turns down. We know how that works. Okay, God can avert that because he has control of nature. But things can also be from a diabolic cause. Every time you commit a sin, you place the thing that you've committed the sin against under the domain of Satan. And you have to take that back. That's done by penance. So this is one of the reasons you have to ask God to avert it, to block the demons from basically being able to make use of the power that we've given over to them. Sometimes, too, we have to ask God to avert these disasters that come from a human cause. And this is very important. There is a tendency today to want to reduce all evils or specific kinds of evils down to a human cause in order for financial gain or in order to control, or in order to manipulate people. In other words, it's true that human beings can be the cause of certain things, right? You'd start dropping nuclear bombs on cities and a lot of people are going to die. That's just kind of the natural effect of it. On the other hand, they're starting to um, blame human beings for things for which we're not the cause. Even when it's the natural mechanism is known, they refused to they refuse to let it rest there because they're trying to make some use of it, in, which is basically what? They're actually trying to introduce into, they're, they're basically trying to gain greater control. I find it the height of irony that we live in an age where people are panicking about the environment and the fact that, you know, there's this quote, global warming or quote, global climate change, at the very time that the Chinese have found a way to genetically manipulate living organisms in two weeks and they're going to flood the planet with these genetically modified things and nobody's paying any attention to that okay so what does this mean well that's why you have a rogation day you have a rogation day in order to help God to avert any natural disasters that can be the result of our cause it's also to ask God for a good and bountiful harvest. I think it's uh, one of the sadnesses of our culture that we don't have an appreciation of the providence of God in this area. Food and things of this sort in our country have come a little too easy. Now, by that I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't try and make it easy, but I'm just saying that we have to have a certain kind of result, uh, reserve and a certain kind of moderation and also an appreciation and gratitude towards God with which all the things that he has given us, because he can retract it. He doesn't have to continue giving it. And so we have to show our gratitude to God for these things 
and petition his providence and obtain those things which are good for us in relationship to food, natural resources, and things of that sort. The rogation days are the 25th of April, that's called the major rogation days, and the three days before the Feast of the Ascension, that's Monday through Wednesday, which are called the minor rogation days. The major rogation, which has no connection to the Feast of St. Mark, was fixed for this date much later. So in other words, even though it's very often done on the, it's done on the Feast of St. Mark, it, that's not necessarily, it wasn't connected to that. Rather, it seems that the rogation day was a much earlier church practice in relationship to fixing it to that specific day. The minor rogations were introduced by later popes, and these were all again done in order for us to recognize our obligations to God. The order to be observed in the process and on rogation days, there's very often, so it's a day of prayer. In the past, it was a day of fasting. It was done, uh, and usually it was observed with um, a procession. So in order to observe in the procession the major and minor rogation, um, one has to say specific things. So there was a litany of saints. There were um, uh, various verses of Our Lady's songs were sung. Um, the litanies could be repent, uh, repeated. Penitential and gradual psalms were often said. Um, and then uh, in the um, ceremony of bishops was also certain aspects that would tell us how to do the, the, uh, the procession in relationship to minor rogations. If the procession is held, the rogation mass is obligatory, and no notice is taken of whatever feast may occur unless only one mass is said, for then a commemoration is made of the feast. If I'm not mistaken, I'd have to look this up, to, commit, to do the rogation procession on certain days actually requires permission of the local ordinary now. An exception is made in favor of the patron of a, t- a titular church, um, obviously, because it's a penitential day, it's, it's violet. And so what this means then, and all of these two things, is the, re- is the calling to us to, um, to do what St. Paul says. He says, I bring my body under subjection. And subjection means that the thing is subordinated to reason and that it's rightly ordered, and that's what these days were designed and ordered for. So sometimes you have to, the rogation days, you can just kind of observe them by saying the litany or something of that sort at home. But normally it's something that's usually done at the church where there's a procession. And you don't see those too often. But if you get a chance to, it's good. And why are processions important? Processions are a reminder of us that we have certain obligations to God to make reparation. Processions are also done to give glory or call attention, for example, in the procession of the Blessed Sacrament um, on the Feast of Corpus Christi. It's in order to celebrate some particular feast or something. So it's, it's there, processions are there to draw our focus and attention on the thing that the procession is about. There's something about human beings, we see this even in pilgrimages. We do pilgrimages in order because just going from one place to another, it helps us to get our focus on where we're going on a spiritual level. And so the processions are important. So my recommendation then would be, in your families, to practice the Ember Days by following the fasting. People say, well, what do I have to do for the fasting? Well, it depends. When you're first starting out fasting, I probably would not recommend following the old church's fasting laws because you're probably not going to be able to do them very well or you might end up with other issues. So I tell people, start following the church's, the, the church's current fasting law, and then once you get to that point, you can start making the fasting more rigorous. St. Thomas says that the body adjusts itself. It's actually a scholastic principle. The body adjusts itself to the operations of the soul. People say, I find fasting brutal. That's totally true. When I was first went to the doctor, and he said, you have to lose weight. This is when I was much heavier. So he put me on this diet. For the first three weeks, your body is like, where's the beef, right? The whole time, it's squealing for food, right? But then as time goes on, it begins to adjust to that. And so that it actually becomes easier. So not only do you have the virtue, but the bodily disposition starts to come into congruity with that. So tell people, kind of start out light, and then you can start making things more rigorous as your body can handle it more. But so my suggestion would be at least follow the church's fasting laws, um, the rules, 
during those ember days. And then on rogation days, you can do the fasting if you want, but then at least at home, do like a litany of the saint, uh, do the litany of the saints in a commemoration of our obligation to um, to ask God for all these things and to make reparation. Um, should I give you a blessing? Yeah. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et filii et spiritus sanctions, superbos et maniat semper. Amen.